Welcome to the Prince Street Church Podcast, where God's Word speaks to everyday life. Good night, John boy. <laughs> That's the phrase that always rattles around in my head every time I think about this classic television show. The Waltons portrayed an era not that long ago where family life was very different than it is today. You know, it used to be that multiple generations of families would be born and raised and work and worship and die all within just a few square miles of each other. Kids had a hard time getting away with anything. Because if your own relative didn't catch you, some neighbor would. And they weren't all reluctant to let your parents know exactly what they saw you doing. Life wasn't always a bed of roses. But there's just no doubt that there are some blessings that come only when multiple generations of people invest their lives in each other. Today, it seems that the norm has become for families to find themselves stretched out over great distances. I, I can remember in my own family's life, my grandfather used to talk about how wonderful it was that he was able to visit with all of his grandchildren in their own homes in a single afternoon. But just one generation later, my own father, his closest grandchild is about an hour and a half away. And some are 700 miles away. In my family, the only time my siblings and my cousins get together well, is for weddings and funerals. And even then, it's not uncommon for somebody to be unable to make the trip. Today, intergenerational life requires a whole lot more effort than it did just a few years ago. And although some of us still have the ability to make it happen on a regular basis, many people today find it a real challenge to be in an environment where multiple generations of people are investing in each other's lives. Some of us have no opportunity for it whatsoever. Frankly, I think that one of the reasons that our, our culture continues its downward slide is because so many of us have lost the ability to gain the benefit that's only possible when multiple generations of people share life together. Well, we're in the midst of a series of sermons that talks about the power of the gospel to bring very different people together. You know, it's because of God's grace that we are able to come together and stay together through all the good days and the bad, through the ups and the downs, when we like each other and when we don't, and especially when we don't. The gospel has the power to bring us together and to keep us together even when so many other people are falling apart. The outline that we've been using for this series of sermons comes directly from our 2020 vision plan, that document that describes what we believe God is calling Prince Street Church to be in 2020 and beyond. And the key sentence that we've been focusing on all through this series is this, that Christ loved us, so we must show his love to others by caring for one another in meaningful ways so that love and acceptance are felt. So we launched the series by talking about how God's love for us compels us to love each other. It's because of Jesus that we know what love looks like. It's because of Jesus that we're able to share that with each other. And then since then, we've been looking at some very practical ways for how we can go about caring for one another in meaningful ways so that love and acceptance are felt. If you've missed any of the episodes in the series, I want to remind you, you can always catch up by heading to our website at PrinceStreetChurch.com. For that matter, if it would be easier for you, you can, you can um, sign up for, on our YouTube channel 
Uh, subscribe, that's the word. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel or the iTunes feed, and the content will be delivered to you directly, however it's going to help you best. Well, today, we are going to focus our attention on another very practical way that we are able to step into the power of the gospel to bring us together. Another very, very rubber meets the road, very practical way that we can share Christ's love with one another. But before we get to it, let's pray together. Oh, Father, thank you for showing us what love looks like. Thank you for giving us the ability to love one another. Thank you for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit among us today. Guide us into truth. And grant us grace to, to not just know what your word says, but also to put it into practice. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, a few weeks back... I preached a sermon about uh, on the first or on a sentence of 2020 vision, but actually I only gave you the first part of the story. And the reason I or here here was, by the way, we anticipate an environment in which every person is valued as a gift from God. You remember that series? You remember that sermon? You know the basic details? If you don't, head to our website at princestreetchurch.com and you can catch up. <laughs> How's that, Michelle? Is that good advertising? Yeah. <laughs> that was the first part of a sentence. And, and the reason I didn't finish the sentence last week is because the rest of this sentence makes a whole lot more sense to preach on Mother's Day. And so, and so in honor of Paul Harvey, let me give you the rest of the story. Here it is. With relationships being intentionally built across generational lines. You know, there's no question as you read the Bible that God never intended for the church to divide itself by age group. Never intended for the church to be divided along generational lines. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with enjoying spending time with people in your same age group. It's a wonderful blessing. But if we fail to be intentional about building generation, about, about building relationships across generational lines, then we will miss out on an essential part of what God always intended for the church to be. We'll miss out on one of the essential details, the essential elements of God's plan for his church. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So grab your Bibles and your note sheet. And join me at Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verses 4 to 7. We're going to look at another very practical way for us to step into the power of the gospel to bring us together and keep us together. Psalm 145, beginning at verse 4. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness. And joyfully sing of your righteousness. Obviously, it's always been God's plan for generations to mix. For the older generation to teach the new generation to rejoice in God. And yes, I said rejoice. Because please look what it says there in verse 4. It says, one generation will teach your work to another, right? No, that's not what it says doesn't say one generation will teach your works to another. It says one generation will commend your work to another. Now, the Hebrew word that's used there is shabach. I like saying that word. 
You don't usually get to make that sound in polite company. Shabbat. <laughs> it's a word that is almost exclusively used for praising God for his glory. Praising God for his majesty, for his mighty acts and deeds. And so it's not just information about God that one generation is to hand down to another. Instead, one generation gets to hand down a legacy of celebration, a legacy of exaltation, a legacy of praise. One generation will commend, will celebrate, will rejoice in your works to another. Now we know what that looks like, right? If you don't, I invite you to head to any ball game where grandchildren are participating and wait for a grandchild to do something at all and watch how the grandparent rejoices. I'll tell you, as much as I enjoyed, as much as I enjoyed watching uh, the ladies sing this morning, uh, Nellie, I'm so glad you sat up front here because I could see the look in your face. Wow. One generation will pass down this legacy of praise over God's goodness. And check out the result. Slide down at verse 7. Look what it says. They will celebrate your abundant goodness. They will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Brothers and sisters, our goal cannot simply be to fill people's heads with stories. The goal can't simply be to, to feed information No, we need to hand down a legacy of living out our faith with commitment, with fire, with enthusiasm. And we're really good at the commitment part, aren't we? How about we push ourselves in the areas of fire and enthusiasm? How about we celebrate God's mighty works in our lives at least as much as we celebrate a single in baseball? Let us hand down a legacy of celebrating. For it's not our job to teach kids to be good religious people. Our job is to introduce our children to a relationship with a God who is head over heels in love with them. Our job as grandparents, as parents, as great-grandparents is to model for our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren and all the generations how excited we are to see that the mighty acts of God isn't just something that happened way long ago in the past, but it's happening right now all around us every day. Our job is to, is to hand down a legacy of celebration that causes our children and our grandchildren, our nephews and our nieces, to meditate, to contemplate God in their lives. Verse 5, they will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. All right, so how does that happen? What is necessary for us to get from where we are to where God is taking us? What's needed for us to be a people who share Christ's love in meaningful ways so that love and acceptance are felt by being a community in which multiple generations invest their lives in one another. Brothers and sisters, if that's going to happen, we've got to make the decision to become intentionally intergenerational. 
God has given us a great gift in each other. And that gift doesn't reside in any specific generation. God has given us a gift in each other, young, middle-aged, old, really old. I better not look at anybody on purpose. God has given us a great gift in each other. And he intends for the church to be this place where generations interact with each other and where one generation passes down this legacy of praise, of celebration. But the reality is that many of us miss out on the benefit that can only happen as multiple generations share their lives with each other because far too often we choose to limit our interactions with people of our own generation. Let's just take a, let's just take a real look at Prince Street Church. Our Sunday school classes are made up primarily of people of a similar age. There are some rebels. There are some young people that attend some of our older classes and vice versa. But by and large, our Sunday school classes are primarily same generation. Our worship services, just look around. There are some rebels, Lyle. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, there's some rebels among us, but by and large, our worship services are single generational events. And many of our activities end up being single generational events as well because when we come to them, we just hang out with the people who are just like us. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that it's wrong to hang out with people from your own age group. There are some wonderful benefits that come along with building deep relationships with people who are at the same point of life as you. It's a wonderful thing. And I'm not being critical of our Sunday school, nor am I being critical about our worship services. I'm not being at all negative about single generational ministries. I'm simply saying that if we are going to live out Psalm 145, where generations pass down to each other a legacy of celebration, if we are going to reap the blessings that can only happen when multiple generations invest in their lives together, then we're going to have to be intentional about making that happen. Maybe a few years back it happened automatically. But those days are gone. If we're going to be experiencing God's plan for the church, we've got to make intentional steps to build relationships across generational lines now that's not going to happen we're not going to get from where we are to where we believe God is calling us to be by simply preaching a sermon showing up for church and hearing what God's word says and doing nothing about it means you've just wasted everybody's time the only way we're going to get from from where we are to where God is taking us is if we put God's word into practice. And so let me stir our thought pots a little bit this morning. Let me, let me suggest a few very practical ways that we could choose to step into the power of the gospel to bring us together by being intentional about building relationships across generational lines. And let's start with our events. One of the easiest ways to build relationships across generational lines is to take the time and make the time to attend events. I know we're busy. I live there with you. Really, I do. But throughout the year, 
there's a number of events that you could choose to participate in. Things like women's teas or wild game dinner. Things like an ice cream social or family day at Rhodes Grove. We, we schedule these events on purpose to give us opportunity to interact. To build loving relationships. So, go out of your way and come. Be part of it. And when you come, avoid the temptation to hang out with the people who are just like you. Instead, make the decision on the way in, I am going to be intentional about building relationships across generational lines. And so, teenagers, when you come for a, a potluck supper, look around and see if there's a senior adult who would like a cup of coffee but doesn't want to fight at the window to get one. Go get that cup of coffee for that person. Senior adult, be sure to sit next to somebody who has young children, particularly if it's a single parent with young children. And help that child eat so that that middle-aged single parent, especially a single parent, so that person can get just at least a little bit of a break in their hectic lives. There's all kinds of ways it can happen. But the only way it's going to happen is if we make the choice to be intentionally intergenerational. Let me give you another one. Attend a different worship service. Let me get out of the way before lightning strikes. Do you know that you'd be shocked how many people from a different generation attend the worship service you don't? You'd be absolutely amazed. So, so here's the idea. Show up periodically at the other worship service. And then just sit where you normally do. Then introduce yourself to the person whose seat you've taken. <laughs> if you really want to be crazy, introduce yourself to the people who sit around you. Particularly those who are from a different generation than you. And if you really want to get wacky, stir up the little kids around you. And I know, I know you have your preference in time. I know you have your preference in style of music. But brothers and sisters, we're never going to move forward unless we do something different than what we're doing now. And by simply periodically attending a different worship service, you could take a huge step forward in being intentionally intergenerational. Let me give you another. Share your faith story. You know, all of us have a story. And all of us would benefit from hearing yours. And by, by sharing your faith story, you realize that you are literally doing Psalm 145? You are literally telling people, you are literally commending God's work to another? So far, most of our stories, all of our stories, have been middle-aged people. My apologies to Daryl Malott, and you're welcome, Jeff Miller. The next couple of stories, I understand, are teenage stories. I hope that works out. But I'd love to hear some senior adult stories. God has done so many things in your lives. And we would love to hear about them. Sharing your faith story is a great way to make a choice to be intentionally intergenerational. And then you could always attend baccalaureate. I know baccalaureate service once upon a time was an event for seniors and their families. I want you to know it stopped being that a long, long, long time ago. Today, less than half the senior class attends. And that includes a number of students and their families who are in church most Sundays. Now, we have a choice. We can sit around and complain and moan about how it shouldn't be that way. 
We could do that. Or we could take, ad- we could take advantage of the situation. For the last several years, our our youth pastors in the region have come together to plan a celebration that glorifies God and celebrates what God is doing in the lives of our senior class. They're wonderful. So how about this year, set aside some time, takes about an hour, show up at the high school, sit in the Prince Street Church section. Did you know we have our own section? Sit with some people you know, or not, and then after the service, stick around for a little bit of time and let our seniors know how proud you are of them. Come with a card. And if you don't know who our seniors are, look for Pastor Dan, look for me, we'll introduce you to them. And if you really want to be wacky, ask him to take a selfie with you. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you could choose in one single hour and 15 minutes-ish to take a huge step forward in being intentionally intergenerational. One more. This one's, this one's kind of out there. How about adopting a class? Did you know we have six adult Sunday school classes in this church? What if each of them adopted one class in the elementary, in the children's department, and one class in the teens? And then figured out ways to interact periodically throughout the year. Throw a a birthday party where you celebrate not just the, the young people, but also the adults in the group. Go have a cookout. Go to a, an, a Shippensburg Stars or Orioles baseball game. They're free for goodness sakes. Um Maybe the kids could throw a Grandparents' Day celebration for their adult class they're partnered with. Maybe teenagers could volunteer to, to um, babysit children for the middle age class that they're partnered with. You could partner in prayer together. You could send emails and text messages that, that, that share words of encouragement or scriptures that you've, that you've encountered through the week that you can share with each other. There's, there's just all kinds of ways that we could choose to be intentionally intergenerational. See, I have this, this really crazy dream, and I, and I realize that it's a crazy dream, but the power of the gospel has the ability to do this. I've got this crazy dream that instead of being just another place where we divide ourselves along generational lines, that the church would be a place where multiple generations invest in each other. And yes, yes, that's going to mean sacrifice. Yes, that's going to mean considering somebody else more important than yourself. Yes, it's going to mean going out of your way. But what a wonderful way to commend God's works to another. What a wonderful way to share Christ's love in meaningful ways so that love and acceptance are felt. On the back of your note sheet... There's a box. And in that box, there are two beginnings of sentences. What God said to me and what I will do about what God said to me. As our musicians come to lead us in a final song, I want to give you and encourage you to take these moments to answer, the, to finish those statements and to create a plan for yourself to put God's word into action this week. Go ahead.